I've done chainsaw carving competitions for three years or four years now, so it's five or six, but I've judged over 150 carving championships throughout the States and Ontario um, over 25 years. I've been carving for 35 years. Basically, there's eight criteria, and one of the things we're really looking for is originality. We're looking at the craftsmanship, how they've used their tools. Is the joinery good? We're looking at the cleanliness of the piece and how they finish it. And we're also looking at what their intention was. When they came here, they had a plan. Did they carry that through? We're also looking at originality. And I'm a stickler for finish, and I like to see clean cuts and a good texture. So there's eight criteria, and we're very strict with those criteria. And one of the things here is the logs are so expensive. We also look at how did they use the log? And um, did they use all of the log, or did they just use half of it? That's also a criteria, which isn't usually at other competitions. I've been here for the entire 35 hours, when it'll be 35 hours, because I want to see how they are using the log. What are they doing to achieve their piece? And you get a real education if you hear from the beginning right until the end. So that I can really judge the piece according to the craftsmanship, how the person put it together, why they did what they did to change the design. And I think one of the most important things is to be able to answer questions if a carver says, well, why did you judge me this way or the other? And then I can say, I saw what I saw. So I've, I've been here the whole time. I, I, I just look at the finished piece and go, that's what I'm judging on but my knowledge base of judging is based on seeing the thing from the beginning. I don't think you can really judge very easily if you're not a carver. I'm, I'm an artist and a carver and I understand what they're doing and I understand their frustration and their joy when things really work out. So um, you have to have experience and this is a very big competition, a very serious one. Um, you have to know what you're doing and this is a terrifying competition to judge. This this week because it's so good. The talent here is amazing. And that's true artistry. It is so difficult to do what they're doing. I'm not a chainsaw carver like them. I can chainsaw carve and I'm a hand carver and that, but I could not do what they're doing. They are truly amazing artists. And the one thing I really look at when I'm judging is how do they approach the wood? How do they approach their attitude is very important as well. And. Um, I think what we look at is the overall piece. But for the observers out here, they're going, how are you going to judge this? People are having difficulty choosing people's choice. That's how good it is this year. And so all of the judges have experience in judging. And um, I happen to be the head judge this year. And it's a scary task, but I have fun. I'm passionate about carving. And um, luckily, I know my stuff. My first time I was here was uh, 2014. Um, first real big uh, international competition. Um, I was really pleased. I, I came in and I was carving with my carving heroes, like these guys. I was just starstruck. And um, but it, I put in and I took second, so I was pretty happy with that. Yes, I started just as a bit of a hobby in 2003, and then 2009 I went full time, and yeah, haven't looked back. The one I'm doing at the moment, I actually got the inspiration from my, my I've got a five-year-old boy and reading him a bedtime story and it was about uh, a robot and a sparrow. And uh, the sparrow flew off in the winter and he just lay there in the snow waiting for him to come back. And yeah, I tend to diversify a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of strange. I, I just try and do a better carving each time, you know. I, I, I like to do all sorts of different stuff from mechanical things to wildlife to human form to everything really. You really got to have a plan before you start, um, or for me. Um, some guys can sort of go with the flow and, and you know their, their carving evolves as they go along, but I come in with a plan and then, I mean sometimes, you know, depending on the wood, it may change slightly. But um, I think it's all about, you know, think, it's like a game of chess. You've got to think, you know, 10 steps ahead. You know, so you know where the next cut's going to be or you know how you're going to shape that or the angle something's going to sit or the movement it's going to give. So, yeah. Some competitions I've had a plan from six months before, um, but then other competitions I've had that plan for six months and then I get to the really right close to the competition and go, no, nah, and then I'd do a whole complete new um, design and 
and change it up in two weeks. So this is the old growth um, red cedar. It's it, oh, it's just fantastic. I mean, I, I carve cypress at home. It's a little harder than this. And then when I come here and uh, you sink the saw in for the first time and it just cuts like butter, this is the best wood in the world, in my opinion. And it, it's a pleasure, you know. You just feel that saw going through and just, yeah, I don't know. It, it's it's kind of different. Every type of wood's got its own kind of feeling, I guess. But um, yeah, but this is real nice. It just you can feel it going in. I've been getting more and more. Um, I used to do a lot of work with uh, power tools at the end, fine sanding and that sort of thing. But recently, I've just gone more and more to the saw and doing more and more finishing with the saw. Now, with the with the range of battery saws that they got now. It, it's really, you can do some really fine work and really small detail with the saws now. And the tips of the saws, the bars are getting smaller and smaller. It's, it's fantastic. In, in the book that my, I was reading, my boy, it's, um, it's a kind of a nice caricature, kind of nice soft little robot. But I figured I had to beef it up a little bit for Chatwin, you know, so it's, a, it's a, like a big military my robot. Great big gun down his arm. Just all beef and, and power. On the left arm, it's gonna have a big blade coming out here, so really menacing. But then he's gonna have this tiny little sparrow sitting on his finger and he's looking at it. Just a wood carver started with chisels probably over 30 years ago. Um, yeah, so I did my first wood carving probably in 1979. I was training to be an artist. I, I was I was working towards um, a, deg a degree, and uh, I discovered well, in England you do a year, a training year before you go and choose which area of arts you do. So you do a bit of everything, and in that year I discovered. That I really liked working with wood. I was aware. I was aware. I was the only woman here, so I felt I needed to do a strong piece. I didn't want to do something that was delicate and feminine. I wanted to do something strong and sort of like you know, so show that I'm you know I'm 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 ready to to be equal to the guys. Um, so I was looking for some sort of woman warrior, uh, and I I was looking at sort of the Norse god Valkyries, and then I came across. Um, a character, sort of an ancient Briton, uh, a queen who actually beat the Romans. She was, she was a real person and beat the Romans and Bud uh, she's called Boudicca and her, it's actually a title and it means she who wins or victory. So I thought it's got to be. That's really cool. <laughs> In the zone, yeah. I mean, it really is. You're just sort of with the flow and, and working, and you ha your mind's on that bit, but you're thinking about the next bit that you're going to have to work on too, and looking at that bit. But does it balance? Have you got your look and say, have, is that the right length to match that piece? And, and you have to keep working. So you, you're concentrating on that bit, but your mind's sort of flitting all over the place to make sure that it's all working, all working together. Uh, a few years ago, in a big uh, competition in England. I did a whole day on the piece and there was a fault in the timber and it was a, what was it doing there? Um, like a, um, a, a, mother, a mother earth type figure and uh, she, she was pregnant and she had lots, lots of oak leaves coming down through her hair and like little uh, almost egg sacs with babies in the hair as well and she'd got children around her and a child in her arms and, and I got sort of roughed out and then all of a sudden this crack appeared across the front of her chest and it was like no I can't have that I could just imagine the auctioneer's hammer going down and it going yeah. <laughs> yeah. so uh, I ended up finding another piece of wood and starting again on that oh, one yeah. I, I, I really like the, what's called a power file and it's a really small fine uh, belt sander and with that you can almost make what looks like chisel marks so it's a lot f it's it's as fast as a chisel but you and some timbers don't chisel mm. they 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 compress and and crush and it just tears 
So you use, have to use a sander for it. So that, and a Dremel, things like that. I have got a die grinder, I use die grinder. I don't like them as much though. They just, they just seem too, too bulky. So my, my tools of choice are a standard angle grinder with a disc on it, a Dremel and the power file. They're, they're my three yeah. go-to things after the chainsaw. Uh, in England, we tend to use a product called Danish oil, mm -hmm. which is a mix of tongue oil and linseed and a couple of other oils, which is a very, a very durable uh, thing. But it's a softer, sort of a softer sheen to it rather than the high gloss that we seem mm -hmm. to have got on a lot of pieces uh, over here. I've been carving for, this is my sixth year right now. And I've, uh, I fell into carving in a very interesting way, but I've adapted and become obsessed with it. I didn't ever study art or anything, so now I'm playing catch up, because you're carving against guys like Jeff and my buddy Pete, who's been carving for, you know, 40 plus years. You carve with guys who've been carving for so long, I've got to like study. So when I'm home, I study a lot. I uh, take classes, online classes with a guy in New York, and I do clay and all kinds of things. Everything and anything that I can do to learn. I really like doing kind of like something that's going to make you think, like the circle of life or predator and prey, who's hunting who, um, kind of stuff that's a little outside of the normal, I would say. So this year, I'm doing something called Grimly Complicated, and it's based off my best friend, Travis. Well, he was my best friend growing up. He just battled over, he battled addiction and then finally lost his life uh, recently with a heroin overdose. And he had skull tattoos all over him. He had a Grim Reaper um, on him, and I saw this image and it kind of reminded me of him. So I thought to myself, you know, what, what could I do that would, you know, th this is like a place where you can create anything you want and I'll never get a chance to do this kind of piece. So I thought, let's do it. So I've got the, uh, the, the, the devil's henchman, I'm going to say, perched on a gravestone, which is kind of going to be like the representation of his. And he's going to have a heart in his hand, which is kind of going to be like the soul. And he's going to be holding it up in, and looking at it kind of conflicted because he doesn't know if he should send it to heaven or send it to hell and the base you're going to have like the devil starting to crawl up and being like give me that give it give it to me mm -hmm. and um and i'm going to try and do it in a golden spiral which is like a form of i believe it's a form of composition and um I'm trying to do it in that aspect so the piece is very balanced and uh, has like really nice clean flowing linear lines and stuff like that and uh, try and get a little uh, little more artsy in my craft with with being you know focused on on proper proper anatomy proper structure proper yeah. you know just really trying to do things proper it is, it's been, it's, it's going to be, it's cool, like I, I downloaded all the music we used to skateboard to when we were kids, so I'm listening to Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden and just totally rocking out, like, it, it's cool, like I've, I've made peace with, with him, so I'm not going to be crying the whole time, but I'm kind of just in the back of my mind just going, you know, like, get it. Yeah. And I'm not putting as much pressure as I have the last few years. I've, uh, I've, I've always put a lot of pressure, like when I did the firefighter last year for my dad and, and Fort St. John, or Fort McMurray, mm -hmm. I, I was really stressed about that piece. And, and this piece, and I templated and I did everything I could. This one, I just want to go with the flow. I want to have fun. I want to do the best that I possibly can as an artist and just see what happens with no, with a, with a solid plan, but just letting it all, like give it, give it all I got, let it all out there and see how it does. Echo chainsaws are the best. Uh, the Makita die grinders are, are some of my favorite tools I like to use. I like to use the finger sanders. Um, the flap sanders are a big thing for me. And really anything that's gonna get the job done. I mean, I, I try and do a lot of chainsaw work and I will try to do it throughout the whole piece. 
once I find like the head and the backbones and the skull, then everything should start to fall into place. So mm -hmm. until I get that, I'll be struggling and it'll be a big log. But yeah. once I find that one aha moment, the, yeah. there's like always that, when, you, when I find when I'm carving, I always have the aha moment yeah. where I dibble, dabble, dibble, and then finally, boom, something happens and I'm, I'm in. Then I've got it, I know where the shoulder is, that means the other shoulder's gonna be here. Everything starts to fall into place. It's like a feeling of relief. Because <laughs> I'm stressed out until I, until I, uh, until I get it. And I, yeah. I, I thought I had it right at the last second and then the bell rang, oh, but, so you lost your but I, I actually stepped back and realized that the shoulder would have been too far forward. So now I'm gonna recess it back. I'm just gonna focus on getting the hood in on the guy's face and uh, let, it, let it go from there. So where do you draw a lot, where do you draw your inspiration from? Pinterest. Yeah, I've, I've been drawing since I was five years old. And uh, I just drew and drew all, that's all I basically did was draw. And then uh, in high school, I got into clay and I got into glass blowing. And I did, uh, I did that for 10 years. I also went to college for digital, digital design. And, uh, but when I was 13, uh, I used to work at a lawnmower shop and my grandmother uh, knew that I wanted to become a chainsaw carver, you know, so I, I bought a chainsaw and I, I tried starting carving, but I didn't really carve, I just kind of, I'm 13, I was just playing around learning how to use a saw. And then uh, I only had it two weeks and it got stolen out of my garage. Being 13, $500 was a lot of money, so I basically just forgot all about it. And uh, 12 years go by and my grandma, she used to always buy the bears at the fair, you know, she loved, she had them all over her yard, you know, she just loved them. And uh, one day when I was, I thought, that's what, what made me buy the saws, I thought I could do that, you know, I, I think I could, I don't know. And, but I forgot about it for years and then about 12 years later, my grandma saw an ad in the paper about carving and she goes, remember when you wanted to do that? And I thought, yeah, I, I do, but I, I don't know, you know, now I'm like, I don't think so. And she's like, well, I'll buy you a saw. And I was like, okay. And she goes, just promise me you'll keep your job. And I said, okay, okay. And so I, I took a small carving class, just a two-day class, you know, very basic stuff. You carve a little bear, you carve a little mushroom and a little eagle and a fish. And then I thought, man, this is what I want to do. And so I just kept carving. I kept my job for about two, three years and uh, just did it on the weekends, but I didn't get to carve much. And, uh, you know, I just played around and I started selling more stuff and getting more orders and I hated my job. So I thought, you know, why not give up all my benefits and all that great stuff and a pay raise coming soon. And, and uh, but I hated commuting too. Yeah. And I hated doing having bosses breathing down my neck and so I quit my job and just started carving full-time uh, my grandmother's wasn't she died right before I went full-time so but when she died that's when I really kicked in and just just went for it and started competing uh, I didn't compete for about three years into it because I was too you know I didn't think I was, could you know, and then I finally, uh, I went to Reedsport for the very first time and I competed as a semi-pro and I took second place. Wow. And, uh, and then I thought to myself, well, I'm not gonna wait around. I'm just gonna make myself pro next year. You know, it's really just a, a tag you put on yourself. And so I went pro the next year and I placed eight out of about 30 guys. So I was pretty happy with that and then I've just been trying to perfect my art ever since, trying to make every piece better than the last one. My grandmother is half Native American, 
and my great grandmother is full Native American, and my uncle's the chief of the Chinook tribe, and my grandmother has had reservation land passed down through generations. Basically, everyone, every woman on the side of the family is is Native, and so. I've always been into native art and my grandmother kind of raised me that way and uh, going to tribal meetings and things like that and I've just always been fascinated with it. And uh, I've done a few native carvings before and it's not something I do all the time. Um, but this is the first time I've been invited to Chetwin and I know it's 12 of some of the best carvers in the world and I thought I'm going to bring something they've never seen before and you know really bring my A game. And uh, so that's what I did. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't just come here with no ideas in your head. I mean, you know, that's, that's not a good thing to do. Um, I've been thinking about it for a few months, but I've, I've thrown about five different ideas around in my head. And, you know, and then I finally came up with this one. He's a raven dancer and there's a story behind it. Um, I can't really, explain it because I, I have it written down. It's not totally memorized word for word in my head. Um, but the raven is, uh, there is an old chieftain. I'll tell the short version. Okay. The old chieftain stole the sun, the moon, and the stars and put them in a wood box and kept them in his house. The raven wanted to release them back to the sky. So he snuck through into the house while the chieftain was sleeping and he went through the, the smoke hole, the chimney, and he stole the box and then he, he released it and released, opened it up and released the sun and the moon and the stars back into the sky. And go through going through the smoke hole and coming back out, see Raven used to be white, but once he went through the smoke hole, he remained black until today. Yeah, I mean, I sand something smooth, and then, you know, obviously the mask is very refined, it's very smoothed out, and then other things are, you know, like moccasins and the leather sleeves, you know, they have to have a texture to them, so, you know, I mix it up, I don't just do everything smooth, I don't just do everything rough, you know, there's bits and pieces, everything's, you know, smooth here, rough here, texture here, you know, and it just gives it a, a, a very, uh, different look because you got all sorts of textures in all different areas and then I use I use black paint and red paint and I use walnut stains and then I use the torch to burn certain areas and sand certain areas and flap sand other areas so I really try to bust my butt the first two three days like at really hard so that I you know I mean I it was a pretty ambitious project, and I have to thank I have to thank a couple helpers, uh, Christian's son Caleb, and uh, Marina's husband Matt helped me out a little bit, and that really got me along the first you know couple days, just just doing a couple little burning and sanding a few things. Uh, it's so time consuming, but I really try to carve as fast as I can, and even though my idea is big. Um, I have it all layered out in my head. This thing, go to this thing, you know, don't wait to do this, just do it now. When something comes in your mind, you know, don't put it back till tomorrow, just do it. Yeah. Just get it done, yeah. you know. And I'll start something and finish it. I'll start the mask and finish it. I'll start the skull, finish it. You know, so then all my components, I'm knocking them all out. I'm not doing it a little bit, then going and doing this one a little bit, then going back to that one. Just boom, 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 boom. Then I get all that out of the way. Then I can focus on the main uh, objective and then put it all together as I go. Uh, born and raised in Connecticut, uh, currently for the last six years have a shop and gallery in Gig Harbor, Washington. Uh, I'll be carving for about 20 years now. 
Well, it was it was just a little bit of change in pace after I got injured years ago and opened up my eyes to a whole new life, whole new world. I was adventurous, rock climbing, ice climbing, snowboarding, and all that, and it caught up with me. Uh, but after that, um, you know, I always use my hands, and I like playing with wood and, and uh, building stuff. But this gave me uh, it, it opened up my eyes to a much uh, any, anything's possible. Let's put it that way. So it got me out of the norm of framing houses and to create in these wood sculptures. Yeah, this year I'm going a little bit different route. I'm doing an elderly couple. Um, I call it uh, Forever Young. Uh, well, western red cedar is a great w wood to work with. Uh, anything that's like, you know, there's great pines, there's great cedars and stuff like that. I prefer that type of wood. Primary, yeah, ch chainsaw, and then uh, as little tools as possible. The more I can do with the saw, the better, but I do have an array of pretty much sanders and grinders. Uh, but then uh, when I get an opportunity to make something nice for, for somebody, uh, that's what motivates me. First and number one thing is get a, get a good solid plan. And uh, the more you prepare for that prior to competition, the better off it's, it takes out all those second guesses. And it's stressful enough and you have so little time to waste time. So being prepared is, it's always an advantage to be prepared. Yeah, no, weather, I mean, it's part of it. I mean, uh, chainsaw carving is done outdoors. so. Hopefully you have a tent, and if the rain's sideways, well, you're gonna get a little wet. But uh, I don't know, sometimes it drives you, it makes you concentrate even harder. Um, yesterday it was hot and sunny, and we were complaining that it was too hot and too sunny, <laughs> and now it's rainy and cold. So, I mean, you just gotta take it with what it is, and it's a competition, and, and uh, it really doesn't affect my carving at all. Like here at Chetwin, you kind of got to have your, your game plan before you, before you show up. You know, seeing your log, then you might have to adjust your plan, but uh, you definitely need to have, you know, your design finalized before you come here. Now it's like, if you had the bigger log, you could scale it up here. You know, you got to scale it down a bit. It's going to be uh, the Predator from the uh, Schwarzenegger movie. So, uh, Pretty excited about this because it's kind of a 180 degree turn from what I'm, I'm usually carving nature stuff, you know, wildlife, and uh, this will be something totally different for me. And pretty excited about it. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the heat. I know even uh, today it was pretty pretty warm out here, but I think the rest of the weekend they're calling for. I think tomorrow is 80, and then the rest of the weekend is kind of cooler. I think rain Friday. So if it rains, it rains. Nothing, uh, nothing we can do. <laughs> Keep carving. <laughs> Yesterday was too hot for me. Today the temperature is nice, but the rain, I guess you, you gotta, there's nothing else you can do about it. You gotta work through it. Yeah. It does make it a pain at times. You gotta keep all your stuff in and, but uh, still get stuff done. If you're getting water on the log, it's, you're gonna have a hard time sanding it. And then you got moisture too in the air and the wood doesn't dry out as good. And then when you go to do your finished work, you're gumming up your sandpaper discs and kind of a pain but with a good breeze like it's usually here it dries out in a hurry. I was all cutting firewood and I decided I was gonna try to uh, carve a bear and it looked like anything but a bear but I fell in love and I stuck with it and I the thing I like about it is you're always looking to get better. I guess once you kind of plateau you might as well find something else to do because there's never I don't think ever a perfect piece. There's always something you can well that's wrong I changed that and that's one thing I like about it. It's like a never, never ending growth. It seems like every year you kind of have one that kind of pushes your limits. And then the following year you look back and it's like, ah, that was, it's kind of easy. So you're always looking for something else. And my next one, I, I don't know yet. I don't know what it's going to be. Chainsaw mostly because you get, you remove the wood the quickest and uh, you get something to look at in a hurry. The next thing is probably like the, uh, the bigger die grinders. Those you can do a lot, a lot with too. But, um, Pretty much chainsaw is my go-to go tool for doing this kind of stuff. There's some times where, yeah, it's got a meaning behind it, but there's some times too where I'm just, I got an idea in my head where I'm going to carve it, and I guess everybody who sees it's going to have a different feeling, so I don't want to tell them the feeling I'm having to persuade their, their thoughts. But, um, yeah, usually just uh, the end product is, is your emotion then. You know, I guess when you start at it, you never know what's going to end up in the end. So, 
This event here is the only one where I've ever had a game plan for a competition. My other competitions I get into, I usually start at the top of the log and work my way down. What happens, happens. But here, you definitely got to think up of something and it's got to be good. You know, you can't have the average uh, eagles, bear, you know, that kind of stuff. You got to have, seems like you got to put yourself more here. Uh, usually my norm, normal stuff is wildlife, so I, I'm out in the woods a lot, and uh, you kind of get ideas from that, but this one here was, I seen a movie when I was a little kid and was kind of in awe by his size and look, and I figured here would be a good spot to uh, try to try to make them. Did you know that Chetwin now has more than one dental practice available? Located in the heart of town, Chetwin Family Dental is here to care for your dental needs. Their practice provides a full range of services that include cleanings, fillings, crowns, and dentures. They even offer Invisaligns as an alternative to braces. And best of all, they offer various treatment options. Here at Chetwin Family Dental, we like to sit down with our patients and go over a comprehensive treatment plan so that we can give them more than one option to help them achieve great oral health. Take control of your smile and book an appointment today or leave them a message on their website. Emergencies and new patients are now being welcomed. Chetwin Family Dental, a family that loves to see you smile. Uh, yeah, I, I like uh, animal carving. Yeah. Uh, African animals. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all world. <laughs> all, all world animal I like. Yeah. And, uh, mm, usually I, I carve uh, chainsaw only. Yeah. I love chainsaw, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I try uh, <laughs> only chainsaw or uh, wet, small detail, yeah. I try. Most, most competitions in Japan are chainsaw only. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the, in Japan, uh, most competitions, almost all, are, are only chainsaw and they judge chainsaw only. So that's the way they carve and they practice that way and they carve everything that way so the least amount of tools they use uh, for them it's the better and uh, his style um, is very very clean like typically there's no sanding you know the chainsaw only no sanding so he really pays attention to the grain in the wood and he turns the saw so that it's cutting with the grain all the time so it's very smooth keeps the saw very sharp and and therefore uh, it, it lends to chainsaw only and so that's kind of where his style of uh, uh, other than you know loving African animals it's it's to do with the, the difference in culture and the chainsaw only uh, Taka loves uh, orangutans ah yes oh I, I have mon monkey <laughs> and yes yeah. Yeah. And he, he really, really loves uh, monkeys, are some of his favorite animals, <laughs> giraffes, and, and a lot of African style animals he, he, he lends towards. And almost all his carvings you'll see a lot. He carves very few bears, not many bears. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes, but not, not many. And, uh, but he, he really, really loves monkeys. Uh, well, he, he uses a chisel, like some of us you'll see, we'll use a die grinder with a, a burr on it and we'll burn the eyes in. You'll see that a lot, and especially in like the speed carving and stuff, and that'll give uh, like a glossy black eye. And Taco will get the same effect, and he'll use a knife and he'll just, he rounds the eye and it's so sharp where he goes in, 
and it leaves a nice undercut for the eyelids and the eyeball. It's actually not a lot nicer, but it's it's very clean, very sharp knife, and it's yeah Japanese perfection here. in about four different sanding tools. Uh, we start with a grinder and come in to take, take down the rougher surface to get a smooth surface going. And then we come in on top of that with uh, a palm sander and it goes over and it kind of brings it down a bit. And then after that, we'll use uh, the Arbor Tech with a buffing wheel, which is fine, fine, fine polishing at that point. And then after that, we come in with the hand sand with fingers and sand out those grooves. That's how you see all of them tight spots getting finished up. It's a lot of work to do because um, fine sculpture looks clean. Um, and, and the idea is to make it look as clean as possible. That's what we're trying to do, you know, take this sculpture to a, to a different level than from just the regular chainsaw finish, right? Um, mind you, some of the parts are chainsaw finished on there and the textures from the shine polish to the rough textures really pop when you got a really nice finished sanded piece into the texture. They really, the shadows will really explode when it gets into the sunlight. Well, all the muscle lines, the, you know, the shadows under the muscles, the hair contrast when it, when it changes, because on a deer, um, the hair is appears to be smooth and shiny, and then in certain spots, it'll it'll be hairy and rough so we're really trying to showcase those uh, different parts of the animal and uh, to match it in with the man so he's a uh, he's a uh, native Iroquois is the design based upon the Iroquois Indians in the Great Lakes and he's the forest protector so he, he would be a powerful beast with muscles bulging he's not a killer but he's just uh, he's the protector so he he has the power to finish the battle before it starts. It's not even an issue to hurt you, it's just an issue to stop you from destroying, right? And uh, so the muscles represent the power of the deer and of, of, the, of the man together. And then into the face, I'm gonna create uh, both. So there'll be half, half man and half deer into the head, which is gonna show that transition in the head as much as the body to body. Um, going for something that I have a lot of experience with and face planting. I average about uh, one every two months my whole, over my whole life so yeah it's something I know that people like to see me do so <laughs> that was that was what I was going for something a bit lighter and uh, I think going with like a I think the bear just because of it's got that big jovial form and then um, I'm a bit more comfortable with the, the form of a bear as opposed to, you know, doing a face planting human, you know, a skateboard or something. Yeah. Then being able to work some of the other characters into it, I'm going to have a little whiskey jack kind of checking him out as he's flying through the air and then a salmon falling out of his mouth. So it's like he, he crashed after dinner, he tripped on the log. <laughs>
Believe it or not, this is my very first event, professional. I think I was kind of forced into this. So it was very good, so I am pro. I'm always a fan of bigger is better. Um, however, I have seen smaller, more finesse, and I'm, I'm a go bigger, go home kind of guy, and I've always pushed my boundaries, and that's my fault for every competition that I go into. I overdo it a little bit. I am Randy Goshi. I'm from Soto Indian Band. I'm from a reserve. I thought, how cool would that be to incorporate some, you know, traditions of Canadian natives into the incorporated into the world of chainsaw carving. I know there's a lot of uh, hand carvers and, you know, West Coast, they have beautiful and world-class mass carvers and totem poles, but I've never carved with a chisel in my life and I kind of like to incorporate my style of carving, but also I, want, I would like to bring in some of my ideas into my, I guess, to the great country of Canada and the natives. So, and I want, I'd like to inspire. So, so there's a lot more than just a, a design and the carving now, but that has just come up as of recently. Rain is never good. Uh, rain keeps the crowds away. You know, ultimately this whole event is for the people and for the carvers to push. So, so basically, um, we want to have the people come and enjoy the show. You know, that's huge. We do it for the people. We work hard for it. So uh, we'd like to see them come out. Rain is not a very good thing. Uh, being too hot is not great either, but at least the people are out, right? So uh, you cannot finish. It's really tough to ver in the rain, even if we are covered, because the moisture does seep underneath the finish. And it may look good now, However, give it a month, then the water starts coming out of it and you have to redo the whole job. So, the finish, yes. Um, so I'm kind of doing a little bit of a, something a little more traditional along the lines in native ancestry, yeah. but not so much in my, my culture, more, more in the new hawk. So this, what I'm doing is I'm doing a raven, I'm doing the raven dance the transformation dance, and um, it's significant to the Bella Coola. So, and I'm incorporating some of their style, their culture into it, and I'm utilizing some of their uh, techniques they use for mask making. So there's a, there's a, a method to the madness. So um, it's gonna be, uh, basically, there's gonna be some, some cloth, like running down the robe, like uh, some strings, if you will, and, and then, um, maybe a bracelet or necklace or something. So see which, which way we can incorporate, uh, incorporate it into the carving. See how much time we have. <laughs> so what, what I want to do is I want to push the moisture into the fibers, and which makes them more malleable. So if the fibers are more malleable, you can work with them, and I want to soften them up and break the fibers up. Because if it's dry and I start breaking up the fibers, uh, they'll start breaking. And once the fibers are all broken and you run them through, uh, they are a lot more malleable, a lot more soft, and they're easier to work with. So. Well, we're checking them throughout the process. I don't know this process. I'm just kind of experimenting with it at this time. So everything I'm doing here is new to me. I've never done this carving before, never tried it, but uh, I just wanted to push my boundaries and uh, do the best I can. So it's a, as I said, it's a raven dance, right? So that'll be a raven head when it's all done. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, shows how good my carving is. <laughs> so, um, so that's all gonna be black and he's gonna be blended in with a black. He's, do, he's in the middle of a dance pose, right? So, so right now he's dancing, he's doing the transformation dance. So that's, that's the pose, so yeah.
I've been carving 10 years and my career was in telecommunications. I, I was a test and turn up technician in New York City and Washington DC for my career. And I moved up to New England to help a company expand their network up to Vermont. And I got a little burnout with the on call. Um, had bought a second piece of property, went to a log home show in Hartford, Connecticut, and there was a guy carving. And I had seen basic square bears before, but it just never appealed to me. But this guy was carving a hyper-realistic grizzly bear, and it just suddenly appealed to me that you can get that much detail into a piece of wood that fast with a chainsaw. So I actually took a class, because I never used a saw. And uh, after I understood the equipment, I called a logger, got a bunch of white pine delivered, came home every night, stood up a log, and worked out my frustration. Yeah. Uh, two years in, I went to a gathering called the Ridgeway Rendezvous out in Pennsylvania. A couple hundred carvers from around the world. The only thing you have to do is put a piece uh, into the auction that helps them kind of backfill the money they put out uh, to help people with meals and things like that. And a lot of competition carvers there doing big pieces. You're donating it. Um, people are going for top auction. And I ended up as a part-time carver 18 months in getting sixth highest out of about 190 carvers. But walking around and seeing the quality of work overall that guys were uh, making a living with, I realized I was already right there. Uh, I had met Jeff Samudowski and Ken Tyne, and Jeff's here actually. And uh, he liked my stuff and asked me what my backstory was and how I started carving. And he was actually the guy at the Log Home Show in Connecticut that I had seen. I didn't get his name or anything when I was there, but uh, he was the actually what got, kind of got me into it. And I quit my day job after about two years of teaching myself. I haven't looked back. And I did actually have a plan. Uh, uh, I wanted to do a single figure, highly detailed, but then I ended up with the biggest log in the log lottery, and the first time ever. Nobody really wanted it. Yeah. Uh, the guys who wanted it had probably the smallest logs, and that they weren't quite what I needed. And I didn't want to knock two, you know, a third off of that log. I hate it when a guy gets the big log and just kind of disrespects it. Yeah. And so I always had a plan B to do a Mother Nature composition, but I didn't have a helper. I didn't have all my tools. Um, I went for it anyway and tried to get out of it what I could. So there's parts of it I liked, um, but I would have liked another, another full day. So this time I didn't really prep as much as I probably could have, but normally I'm gonna have the idea. Uh, I might do a practice piece and I'm gonna make it flexible. So when I get here, depending on the log lottery, I can kind of adapt it to whatever size log that I get. So next time. Uh, it's not a podium piece. I know that going into it. Uh, there's aspects of it I like, so I would look at it as a learning piece. Um, and it's something I want to revisit. That Mother Nature, I just, I grew up in the woods. Even though I grew up in North Jersey, I grew up hiking in the woods a lot. And I just, it's always a piece that's appealed to me, mixing in the wildlife, mixing in the seasons and in her dress. And so it was, uh, it was a, a first attempt, but there's going to be another one. I'm kind of a Neanderthal. I, uh, I do a lot with a little. Uh, I've got my chainsaws and I've learned to get it as tight as possible with the saw. And then angle grinder uh, with a sanding disc, uh, die grinder with a few shaped bits, a drill with different flap sanders, different wire brushes, fire. I use a lot of torching usually when I've got time for it. And then when the, I do a lot of commission work, so when the budget's there or if I'm doing a me piece, something for myself, I break out the chisels, slow down, and use chisels to kind of bring out the detail. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take um, the angle grinder, I'll sand out all those flat spots. Well, oh, actually, I, yeah, yeah, usually it depends on the piece. There's some variation. Uh, the die grinder, I'll set the eyes, set the nose. Uh, I'll burn it uh, pretty heavily depending because that's less sanding when you burn something. And then I'll use the drill with nylon brushes and wire brushes to knock back that burn. Uh, and then I'll kind of do another sweep again with some of the other tools and the chisels a little bit to tweak the eyes and tweak the nose. But uh, not, not a lot. I mean, you can do so much with so little with yeah. wood. Uh, I had to do a big alligator for a, a flower show and it was, I didn't have a lot of time, so instead of sanding the whole thing, I used oxyacetylene, which burns hot. I burned it, burned it, and then I knocked all that back. It raised the grain, it cleaned up all the fuzzies. So it was a time saver. Yeah, and I would have done that up here if I had my oxyacetylene burn in between all those rocks, clean up all the little hangers and furry stuff you can't get to. 
and then you can get a wire, a, a little nylon brush in there and clean it all up. Yeah. I just didn't have that option here. Yeah. This is the best competition in the world. There's a World Cup in Germany, but as far as being able to come up here with no theme, with wonderful wood, uh, with a town who's an incredible host, this is, uh, this is a family reunion when you come up here. And we all know each other, we all see each other all over the world. You know everybody is uh, going full on here. Um, I mean, you can see when you walk around there, there's, most of those pieces are podium pieces. Most of those pieces in another competition are first place pieces, but there's only one first place. I do not envy the judging up here, but we all love Chetwind. We make the effort to get here. I mean, two weeks notice, um, not a cheap flight, rent a truck, fly into Edmonton. I'll break even, uh, and it's a win-win for me. I, I'd love to see him take all these older pieces, put up a steel building and start a museum. You have the evolution of chainsaw competition pieces in this town, and it would be wonderful instead of seeing him sold off to see him stay here so people could come in and see how things have evolved over the last 13 years. Pretty incredible. I've been carving full time. This is, uh, I think, in February it'll be seven years. So I'm working on my seventh year right now. I've uh, been carving probably about 10 years now. Well, I guess maybe about 11. But um, I don't know, time flies. <laughs> well, it was a hobby, you know, like a lot of us start out just goofing around and it just grows into something. A lot of the guys that are here I met like nine years ago. Um, I learned a lot. I mean, I kind of look up to a lot of the carvers that are here. And, uh, you know, on my bucket list, I always thought it would be really cool to one day be in a competition with these guys. And yesterday I was looking around and I couldn't believe that something that I had always wanted to do was happening. And uh, it was pretty cool. So it's, well, w w with what we do, there's not a lot of people that do what, what we're doing. And uh, to come together and then all try to make a really cool piece, um, it's kind of neat that we can help each other out and uh, talk and, you know, help each other with what we're doing and creating, so. Well, my piece, I have been wanting to do this piece for a while, so I'm always thinking about things that I'm seeing and then I try to remember that or I'll do a sketch of different pieces that I think eventually could be something that I could make in the future. I might not make it for, like, the piece that I've created, that was like five years ago I thought about that piece. So it's just a piece that I've always wanted to create. And I thought if I ever had the chance in a competition, it would be a, a good piece to make. So um, just, I don't get to create wildebeests and crocodiles very often where I live. It's always bears, eagles, and you know, turkeys. And so, but yeah. Uh, I like to be out in the woods. I like to be fishing, hunting, hiking. Anytime I can be outside or even at the beach, I mean, just, Nature in itself is uh, all the inspiration that I need. Um, I like to create wildlife sculptures, so most of the pieces, you know, that's where I'm getting my inspiration from. You know, they all have something a little different that, uh, that I like. Even sometimes it just comes down to just the smell of it is nice, uh, but uh, some pieces hold a better detail than others. Um, I was in California earlier this spring in March. I got to carve some uh, old growth redwood. That was pretty cool. I mean, I'm carving a piece of wood. It's like 2,000 years old. Um, that's pretty neat. Uh, I've carved some sinker cypress, really old cypress that was pulled up out of a river. That was some cool stuff. Some of that could have been cut down by the Native Americans. You know, it's so old, the wood. Um, I guess the, the old growth type wood is just has something about it that almost feels sacred like I'm not supposed to be carving it you know because it's so old and I don't know but it's kind of neat because then you breathe life back into the piece of wood and uh, you know that's pretty cool too this wood here well it's a log draw in the competition so my original idea is still pretty close to my original drawings 
Uh, but when I saw some of the really large logs here, I really would have rather had a larger log. But the more I've, I took and looked at the piece that I had, I kind of figured I can, if I cut it right, I can make it happen. I just have to make the right cuts. Don't, you know, don't make any deep overcuts. And I, could, I was able to take my piece of wood and create what I was looking to do. So it actually turned out. And then I'm seeing some of the other guys that kept their big logs because I wanted to trade. They kept them. And now it's such a big log, they're running out of time because they're carving so much and they had to take so much wood out of that log. Whereas mine, it was such a smaller log, I was able to just take what I had to work with and I didn't have to make as many big cuts as they did. Yeah. So it actually kind of worked yeah. to my advantage. Yeah. But, um, well, that's the thing about the logs, you just never know what's in there. I mean, uh, there were some other logs I saw, one of the carvers, uh, the face just fell off of her piece. It, it just got so much rot and then it just falls apart. So I saw them, they were in there patching it, trying to put glue. I didn't have any issues like that. I got lucky, my log was pretty solid. So uh, I had a few small cracks, but nothing that wasn't, you know, nothing major. So personally, I like burning and I like the, uh, the shadow effect of even just hitting with a little color or paint. It brings things to life, I believe. Um, if you have a sculpture, that looks good raw without any burning or any color. You've got a good sculpture. Once you add the colors and the burning, it just enhances it that much more. So I knew that once the piece was carved and finished, I talked to some other guys. They said, don't paint it, don't burn it. I was like, nah, it's gotta be burnt. There needs to be a separation of different pieces, you know, of what's going on in the piece. So with the crocodile coming up, the white teeth of the sapwood that I used, the wildebeest, I needed to have that dark color of the wildebeest, so I went in and burnt it. Um, I think it worked. Yeah, I just walk around it, keep looking at it. I finished mine for the most part yesterday. Um, I walked around this morning, just took a look at it, sanded a few little spots, put another little burn on it. But uh, yeah, I, I'd like to say I got lucky with how it just turned out and everything just went smooth. I had no issues. I didn't have to fight the log. I already knew in my mind what I was making. So it just it flowed so nice. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I had a good time. Yeah, yeah. yeah the carb was fun. <laughs>